bioweapons effectiveness can be measured in terms of lethality, ease in manufacturing, and infectivity. Anthrax, while lethal and relatively easy to manufacture, cannot be transmitted from one person to another. Other bioagents are only moderately infectious, but extremely lethal, like Ebola. Ebola is a viral hemorrhagic fever. It is fatal in 50 to 90 percent of the cases, which makes it extremely lethal. Um, but actually, it is not as easy to transmit Ebola from person to person as it is to transmit smallpox. Smallpox may be the true bioterror doomsday device. The dreaded scourge that killed over a billion human beings through the centuries could return as a weapon. The year 2014. Ten suicide terrorists infect themselves with a highly virulent strain of variola major, smallpox. Walking through international airports, subways, and malls, they infect 20 cities in four continents within 48 hours. Ten days later, the first symptoms hit America, Europe, and the mega cities in India and Brazil. Without enough vaccine to immunize the world, millions die. The smallpox virus, once eradicated worldwide, is back. Smallpox uh, was targeted for global eradication by the World Health Organization in the 1970s. Global eradication was declared a uh, success in 1980. At that point, naturally occurring disease uh, had, in fact, been eradicated from the planet, and uh, we would have been free of smallpox entirely had it not been for the uh, Soviet weapons program, which developed smallpox as a biological weapon. Today, the smallpox virus exists officially only in two places, at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta and at the Vector Institute in Siberia. But that is a rosy picture, considering the vastness of the former Soviet bioweapons program. That program uh, reached its full strength in the mid-1980s and, uh, and uh, continued until it was essentially shut down in 1990. The problem is that with uh, literally ton quantities of smallpox virus being produced, it's unimaginable that all of that material was actually destroyed. The Soviets reproduced over a dozen lethal bioagents in ton quantity, including a genetically modified antibiotic resistant strain of plague. But smallpox was the most massive project. A particularly virulent strain called India 1 was cultivated inside a 300 gallon tank called a bioreactor. Inside, living monkey cells were maintained at the temperature of blood. Cell nutrient fluid and variola virus were pumped into the bioreactor, creating a perfectly engineered smallpox breeding ground. One batch could produce 100 trillion lethal doses of smallpox, and they made thousands of batches. The Soviet bioweapons industry, while by far the world's largest, wasn't the only advanced biowarfare program. America did have an offensive biological weapons program. It was uh, during the height of the Cold War, and it was discontinued by President Nixon in uh, 1969. Between the 1940s and the late 1960s, the United States produced significant amounts of anthrax, plague, botulinum, and a host of other agents. Many were tested in the million liter sphere, known as the eight ball, at Fort Detrick, Maryland. Deadly agents were aerosolized, and spores and powders were packed into bombs and artillery shells. With these doomsday devices long ago dismantled, Fort Detrick today stands at the center of the battle against bioterrorism. Scientists here and at the CDC are doing their best to prepare for the worst. According to Russian scientists, the Soviet Union had developed an ICBM equipped with 10 warheads that could each release up to four and a half pounds of smallpox mist over an American city. More doomsday tech will return on Modern Marvels. There are many strategies in the preventive war against a doomsday bioterror attack. The first is knowing your enemy, the disease. With highly contagious lethal diseases like smallpox, Acquiring hands-on knowledge 
is a deadly serious task. Smallpox has to be studied under what's called BSL-4, biosafety level 4 conditions, the so-called spacesuit laboratories, in which they're highly secure laboratory scenarios, so nothing can escape from the laboratory. These researchers studying smallpox at the CDC, like anyone entering a level 4 lab, must first don the plastic biocontainment suit, often called the spacesuit. Every opening on the suit is taped shut. And the shell checked for leaks. Researchers are also tethered to an air supply. All of the uh, air, both the intake and exhaust, goes through what we call high efficiency particulate air filter or a HEPA filter. The HEPA filter uses ultra-fine fibers that can filter out particles down to one-third of one micron, the size of a small bacterium. Alarm sound if the filters experience a change in air pressure. Uh, laboratory workers, when they leave the spacesuit area, uh, go through a chemical disinfection uh, shower before they exit the laboratory. Why do CDC scientists go to such trouble to study these last traces of smallpox? The smallpox virus is actually voted to be destroyed quite a few years ago by the World Health Organization, and unfortunately, bioterror then raised its ugly head. And the decision was made to not destroy them so they could be studied, so that you would not have something that then was in the hands of the bad people and not in the hands of the people that needed to be studying it. At USAMRID's Level 4 lab, Army scientists go through the same ordeal to study another deadly enemy, Ebola. We're interested in the basic pathophysiology of the disease. What is it about the infection with this disease that causes such a serious uh, life-threatening illness? Uh, we are also looking to develop antiviral drugs that are effective against the uh, replication of this virus. The vacuum-sealed quiet of the research lab is at the heart of the effort to prepare life-saving vaccines and antibiotics. But if the unthinkable should occur, the response will be far from quiet. It will resemble an army mobilizing. If there were a bioterror attack, there would be a worldwide international response, despite where the attack happened. The first wave of response would be the CDC's strategic national stockpile. The strategic national stockpile is a program within the CDC that prepositions material that's selected confidential sites across the United States. The stockpile itself is made up of medical supplies, everything from bandages to hydration fluids to certain vaccines to antibiotics. They are in what are called push packs that can be gotten out the door into any place in the United States within 12 hours. Teams of epidemic intelligence officers, known as disease detectives, would fly to the affected areas and trace the path of the disease mass vaccinations would take place immediately. We would start out with vaccination in the area that the case occurred, and then you expand out from there. You have several days in which to vaccinate to either halt or ameliorate the effects of the, the, the agent. This same strategy, called ring vaccination, was used by the World Health Organization to eradicate smallpox in the 1970s. Healthcare workers begin at the points of infection and increase in ever widening circles until everyone who may have been infected is vaccinated. Coupled with this technique would be the use of quarantine. If somebody were to come down with smallpox infection, they would quarantine the person and everybody that person had come in contact with. Your house, your family, you know, everybody at work would be quarantined along with all of their family. I mean, there would be a really extensive quarantine. The CDC has quarantine operations set up at eight major airports and several seaports. In the event of an attack, this will be the main weapon in containing the smallpox demon. Well, the vaccination uses a, uh, what is called a bifurcated needle. It's a small uh, dual prong needle in which it's pressed into the skin about 12 to 15 times on primary uh, vaccination. And the virus replicates in that wound, causes a scab to form. When the scab falls off, you are immune from smallpox. The smallpox vaccine is in fact a cowpox virus. The word vaccine comes from the Latin word for cow, vaca. 
the man who discovered the vaccine, Edward Jenner, observed that cow hands who had contracted cowpox, a much milder form of pox, didn't contract the deadly human smallpox. In today's vaccine, the cowpox virus builds up a person's immune system to the point where it can fight off smallpox. Recent breakthroughs may also cut the doomsday potential of this and other deadly agents. Well, this is a uh, handheld biosensor that we developed for the Department of Defense. Well, the system is very versatile and can detect a wide variety of different pathogens, including things like anthrax, smallpox, ricin, Ebola. A drop of the suspected pathogen is placed on this specially designed test strip, which is then inserted into the sensor. There's a small laser in here, similar to what is used in a CD player, that excites the species on the strip and it measures the intensity of the, of the light coming out as well as its position and uses that to determine what species uh, it has detected. It says that uh, it has detected Bacillus anthracis, which is anthrax, um, with 100% certainty. Such rapid results could trace the path of an outbreak in minutes rather than hours or days. our high-speed interconnected world may hasten the spread of a disease. Instant communication will also be crucial in containing a bioterror attack. Whether it's the CDC's nerve center or healthcare professionals sharing their observations on the internet. In 2003, an online medical forum called ProMed played a critical role in alerting world health officials to a deadly outbreak in China that would become known as SARS. China was very slow in releasing any information about SARS because they were worrying about the effect of its uh, going into the World Trade Organization, about tourism, so it became hidden. So I went up on ProBed and asked, anybody else heard anything about this? And within 24 hours, it was acknowledged to have uh, occurred. Although a naturally occurring virus, SARS stimulated a response that may mirror the defense against bioterror. Within weeks, the spread of the virus that killed over 900 people was contained. The future of bioterror and the tools to fight it may be in the arena of biotechnology. Already, scientists are unraveling the genetic secrets to the deadliest diseases, but the technology may be a double-edged sword. Scientists recently used reverse genetic engineering to resurrect the single greatest plague of the 20th century, the Spanish flu that killed up to 50 million people in 1918 and 1919. Altering the DNA of a virus now makes it possible in theory to design a super virus that could wipe out large populations. In 2001, scientists in Australia inadvertently engineered a deadly strain of mousepox for which their lab mice had no immunity. The concern is that a similar trick uh, could be used uh, to introduce the gene into uh, smallpox virus. And uh, there's the theoretical concern that if such a strain were created, our uh, strategy for containing the disease spread with vaccine alone uh, might be flawed. If such a grim scenario became reality, we can at least take heart in the knowledge that human beings have defeated seemingly invincible plagues before. Hopefully, we can do it again. The word quarantine is from quaranta giorni, Italian for 40 days. It refers to the length of time that ships were forced to sit at anchor before being allowed to enter a port during the Black Death. More